So go and grab your Bible and turn to Philippians uh, chapter three. I think I'll say this every week. This is an amazing passage. <laughs> if you know Philippians well at all, it's just every passage is amazing. It's why many of us have memorized a lot of Philippians. Um, we're memorizing chapter two, verses one through 11 together. Okay, all of us together. And if you're watching online, I hope you grab your Bible. Always the text for this course we need the Lord's guidance, we need his power, we need his direction in our lives today. And uh, I want us to talk about this new confidence. We've been talking about all things new that he's given us and now today we land on an incredible passage of scripture. We'll get there in a bit as I set it up. It was on May 29th, 1992. It was about 30 years ago, a lifetime ago for some of you, the Texas lottery, the first ticket was purchased by Ann Richards, then governor of Texas, at a place called Folk's Feed, uh, Polk's Feed Store in Oak Hill. Now, since then, some would boast that some $20 billion of revenue has come into the state to public schools, veterans, among others. $39 billion has been distributed to people who've, who've won in the lottery. I don't know about you, I have never purchased a ticket uh, for the lottery, never will. I don't think it's a Great idea. I remember when it first came out. I'm old enough to remember uh, when it first came out. They, their, their key line was, um, you, you can't win if you don't play. And I remember thinking, no, no you, you can't lose if you don't play. Uh, some might be more, you know, a little bit more bold than, than me when it comes to wagers, when it comes to betting. Uh, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the lottery. Some would say, you know, there's been a lot of wins for a lot of people, I would say there've been a lot more losses because it tends to feed um, the, you know, the already poor, impact the already poor, I think in so many ways. But all, all that said, you may not be a fan of the lottery. I'm kind of ambivalent about it, I suppose. But uh, we all take risks of some sort, right? It's part of life. We, we wager, we, we gamble on certain things. We make investments of money, many of us, or, or you invest your time into something, hoping it reaps benefit. You invest in relationships, hoping to get something back. We, we, we seek uh, a gain, even if there might be a loss initially, there's, there's gain to come. Some wagers are big, some wagers are very small. You took a risk of sorts in just being here today. You'll take risk as you leave here. We'll take some risk, we'll wager, we'll gamble along the way in big and small ways. Blaise Pascal was a great a French philosopher, mathematician, theologian, um, and he was the one who said that all humans offer a, a really a wager. They wager their lives. They gamble their lives on whether God exists or not. Think about that. Because if he exists, then you've been created by him. There is a moral, ultimate good or bad bad in the world. Without him, there is no moral good or bad. You can't claim anything is good or bad. Everything's relative. You're not here for a purpose. There's no reason behind your existence. And when you die, it's over. He put it this way in what's become known as Pascal's wager. Belief is a wise wager, he says. Granted that faith cannot be proved Okay, we could talk about that for a bit, I suppose. What harm will come to you if you gamble on its truth and it proves false? If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then without hesitation that he exists. Okay, put another way, I've heard it stated. If I believe that God exists, if I give my life to Jesus Christ, God revealed most perfectly, ultimately through Christ, who came and died on the cross for me. I received that by faith, yes, praise God, not by works, not by how smart I am, by faith I received this. Then if I believe that, when I die, I have everything to gain, eternity to gain. If you don't believe that, then you have everything to lose. Now, I've always struggled a little bit with Pascal's wager, not because I don't think it's right and true. He's trying to bridge the gap uh, between those who are atheists and do not believe in God at all. He's saying, okay, but consider this, just that you might cross the bridge a bit. What I've struggled with, it sounds a lot like, you know, let's hope 
that in the end, that it's right. And maybe you have felt this way in your life at times. That, that okay, it, it sounds like, hey, you know, it may not be in the end, but in the end, if I give my life to God, I just seek to be like Jesus, I'm gonna live a good life, I'm gonna love people. In the end, if it's not true, then I lose nothing. But you lose everything if you don't believe, right? Don't we have more confidence than that? Don't we have much more confidence that God is who he says he is, that Christ is who he says he is? Jesus would put the wager this way in Matthew 16. He says this, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man or, or a woman, anyone, if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? What does it mean to lose everything to gain Christ? Think about this. If you had an investment you were going to make, let's say a financial investment. A lot of us run there, I suppose. What if you knew you did a cross, you know, cost-benefit analysis? You knew that the ROI was going to be a million-fold. What if it was a billion fold in what you were placing toward this investment, this wager, this gamble with whatever you're putting into the account? What if you knew that it was coming back a million fold? How about this? What if you knew whatever you're investing, and in this case, our lives, you knew that what you get in return is a life of joy, a life of peace, a life of purpose, and life here and now and for eternity. Jesus said it this way in John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Some of you know this is zoe in the Greek. Life abundant and eternal. This is the promise. This is the offer. This is the wager. For us to give our lives to him. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, we find a man. We know that it's apostle, the apostle Paul who gave up everything in his life that he might gain Christ. And today I want you to see what has been affirmed in my life this week as I've been in this text, that the greatest passion in my life and in your life if you're a believer, the greatest pursuit of your life is to know him, to know Christ and to know all that there is to know of him. And it is a constant pursuit. And it is worth everything to pursue Christ and to know him. It's worth your life itself. I'd say it this way. This is what I want for you today. My thesis today, the central truth is this. Jesus gives me all the confidence I need to give all I am to him. And this is what Paul has understood. And I, you can't imagine with all the passion I can muster up. I can't be smart enough, bold enough, uh, creative enough for you to grasp the truth of this text that I think will change your life. Re be reminded again of the great confidence you have in Christ. If you have received Christ as your savior, if not, this message is for you as well. That today would be the day that you turn your life over to him. Here in chapter three, Paul lays out a ledger Okay, the first six verses, he shows us what he's lost, what he thought was gain. When he met Christ, his ledger was flipped. So he shows us what he's lost. The next five verses, he shows us what he's gained. And, and, and we're gonna see, before he came to Christ, he was looking on one side of his ledger, all of his good works. It was the focus of his life. It was the pursuit of his life. It was everything that he sought to do to be righteous before God. That's all he knew. That's all anyone knows apart from Christ. Your good works, your sense of, I need to accomplish this, I need to be good enough, and you're pursuing it all of your life without Jesus. And then he says this, finally, this is verse one. Finally, my brothers and sisters, can be translated, rejoice in the Lord. Now he says, finally, this is what we call chapter three. This is just the latter part uh, of, the, of his book now. He's shifting almost halfway through. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. He's saying, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to repeat myself. I hope you don't mind receiving it. Uh, better safe than sorry. Let's go. Verse two, look out for the dogs. 
Now here, ironically, this word dogs, it was a, it was a word of, of ridicule. It was against those who were evil, as you'll see here. He says, look out for the evildoers. It, it was a word that was used to, to say these people are wrong, they're twisted. It was kind of a vernacular of the day. Look out for the dogs. And notice, the, the, he's not speaking to the pagan. This is interesting, ironically. Not speaking to the Gentiles. Every Jew would have said, they're the dogs. We're God's people. With, it, with a sense of, of pride. Instead, he's talking, speaking of the Judaizers. This is his former tribe, if you will. He, he says, no, 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 no. They think they've got it right. And then he offers a play on words. He says, look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. And put no confidence, there's the word, no confidence in the flesh. Now the play on words is mutilate and circumcision. They, they come from the same root word essentially in the Greek. And what he's saying is here is, is that the Judaizers, their supposed badge of pride and honor turns out to be their sign of destruction. Wow. Now if we hung out there for a while, what we hold as a badge of pride, I've been doing this for years or I am a good person. You're not so much. I'm a church goer. I'm a Christian. I am, I, and Lord, I brought this to you. I've done this now. I've been doing this for years. I, I mean, I, I, don't I deserve something? Don't I deserve th something better than what I'm getting here? What might it be that we hold out as a, what well, looks like a, it was ministry, it was this, or a badge of pride that becomes a sign of our destruction? Meaning, well, now I'm, I'm prideful. God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Now I become judgmental of others because it didn't go my way. You see, he's saying, no, 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 now it's flipped. Look at verse four. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. Here's that word confidence. He used it a couple of times. I have confidence. This is what we're talking about today. If, if, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, that is my good works, what I'm doing, for God, I have more. And then he offers this resume that would put any Hebrew to shame. Circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, I, maybe my family brought me, like the children today. I was, I mean, from the start, I was all in. And he says, for of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the best tribe of all, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as an, I'm an expert in the law. No higher learning as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. You want to think I was passionate about this. I was persecuting the church as we see in the book of Acts. As to righteousness under the law. Blameless, he says. These are bold statements. Paul lays out a resume that's unmatched by any Jew. Then and today. He put all his confidence in the flesh, he says. So what did he gain? What did he gain from his choice? And today we're going to see three things, three reasons, if you will, benefits, gains that will offset any loss that you may have in life. These gains, these profits make up for any momentary affliction that you may have in your life right now. And we're all walking through momentary affliction. Why give up everything to follow Christ? Why would you and I do that? Because we all need a new confidence. We need a new confidence that is found in him. If you're going to give up something, it better be worth something so much more, right? If you're going to give, give away something, you better receive something better. But if you're a Christian, you've experienced this like I have. What you thought was once exciting is now depleting. What you thought was at the highest of your, on, of your list or on this side of the ledger of gain, you found now is loss. The more you come to know Christ, what was once life for you is now death and it's found in him and you're pursuing him with all you've got. I was with our group uh, of high school students uh, last week. I was at one of our crew groups. We have throughout uh, all over North Texas, North Dallas really. And I was at one of our groups and we were talking about commitment to Christ. And we had a little Q&A with the pastor. And had a great time with these high school students. One of them asked, well, what do you do when you're, when you're being pressured by all your friends? Like I have a group of friends and, and a lot of, they're, they're doing drugs. And another one said, yeah, I've got a group, I've got a group of friends that are drinking like crazy. They just want me to go party with them. What do I do? What do, I do? And my first thought was, well, you need some new friends. Is what, you know, so 
Well, that's good. You know, but here you've got friends. We've got believers. So then they started to encourage each other. Or I'm there answering the questions. I'm the one teaching. And I'm like, okay, let's go. And, and they begin. Here's why I don't do drugs. Because I've seen what it does, is what one student said. I have a friend who does drugs. Mom did drugs. I went to their home. Their home is a mess. Their family is so jacked up. I don't, I don't want that. I want Christ. That is a loss for me. I want to say no to that. I'm going, let's go. And let, you know, they continue to encourage this one, one young man. And, 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 and what we ended was, because you've got something better is why you don't do drugs. You're telling your friends, and they are in awe of you. They may not tell you this, but they're saying, wait, why don't you follow the rest of us? Because I don't need it. And then we grow up. What is it in your life where others are looking at you and you're standing out because you don't walk the way of the world? Why would you give up so much of what the world says is gain in order to follow Christ? Why would you give up that, 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 that greedy kind of spirit that you have? Why would you become more generous for something greater? something better. Why would you cease to have that attitude toward that person or the unforgiving uh, spirit in, with someone in your family or someone at work that you know because of something better that shows the light and salt that Jesus asked us to be in the world? Why would you, can I say it, cease to drink as much as you're drinking for something better? Why do we give up in order to follow Jesus because we know that he's better. But friends, are you convinced today that he's better than anything else? And here's what's hard for us. We get to that point, And for some of us, as we get older, we have to, if we're going to end a certain habit, end a certain way of living, we have to admit I was wrong. I was wrong. And we have such a hard time doing that. What we need is not simply a cost benefit analysis. We need the explosive power of a new affection that's found in Christ and him alone. So that's what I want us to see here. We've seen what he gives up. Now I want you to see three gains, all right? And these gains, these new uh, gains that he makes, these benefits to following Christ, I have now, I have a new pursuit of Christ. You're gonna see it here. A new position in Christ. And then finally a new power with Christ. Christ. We're going to break it down. Look at verse seven. He makes this remarkable statement. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. You see his loss gain language here. For the sake of Christ. One side of the ledger, gain. The other side, loss. And then Christ completely flips it for him. And so now we're going to see a new pursuit, a new position and a new power. First, a new pursuit. He's no longer pursuing salvation according to his own works. And it was his entire life. Because here's what I want you to see. This new uh, pursuit, this new trajectory of his life changes everything. Whatever you are pursuing, what you think you are becoming changes everything about your life, every decision you make. I could put it this way. Show me your habits today. Show me your habits this week. I will show you who you're becoming. And if knowing Christ is the greatest pursuit of your life, it will be marked. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a theory. How would I know if he's the number one pursuit in my life? How would you know? Your prayer life would reveal it. You'd be in his word. You can't get enough of him. And he reveals himself through his word. You would pray without ceasing. You would want to know him above all else. You would make time to spend time with him, to seek to know him, to obey him. And then you'd want to tell others about him. That's how you would know. Is it true of you? Is Christ the highest goal in your life? To know him, is that the highest pursuit of your life? Because in him, we have a new pursuit. It's the pursuit of Christ. Whatever you're pursuing is driving your life today. Look at verse eight. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. This is another way, the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. 
So verse eight, he, here's, here's the new leisure, all things lost to gain the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ. Think about this, to be a disciple of Jesus, and I'm saying disciple, not, not Christian, a word that's been hijacked by a lot of people who are not believers, but to be a disciple of Jesus means that you know God. This is what separates you from everyone else. Jesus said to his disciples that you know God. He said, I know my own and my own know me. John 17. He said, this is eternal life that you may know the true and living God. John, 1 John 5, 20. So that you may know the one true God. To be a disciple of Jesus, to be a true Christian means that you know God. Do you live with this constant knowledge of God that I know him, I want to know him more. This is what separates disciples from all, all others. We actually know him. See, see, you may know someone and you could describe them to me. Maybe, maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe it's a famous person. You could really describe them to me. Maybe you're a history buff. You could tell me all about someone in history, but you don't know them. Many people know a lot of scripture. They know what to say about God. They might know doctrine, but they don't know God. Say, so how would you know? Well, they're not pursuing to obey him and to follow him, to abide in him. This is the test compared to everything else in your life. The highest value of your life is it to know God with everything that you've got. And then Paul goes further. He says, I, I count everything else as loss, not only lost, and the King James puts it rightly, you may know, dung is what it was and what it is. And that's the proper translation, by the way. Trash in comparison, garbage in comparison to all that the world would offer and all that I could bring to the table. He says, I've, I've tossed that away. It's, it's dung, it's garbage. Makes me sick now to think about. Look at this radical shift in his life. Look at verse nine. And he qualifies it even further. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. This verse right here, this is it. Circle this one. This is the gospel in a verse, like many other verses. But this one, be found in him. We talk about this all the time. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Can you imagine a committed Jew, religious man, and, and with all the proper motivation, really, I want to I want to appease God, I want to I want to be good enough. And the day he finds out there's a righteousness that's come outside of himself, that his righteousness can't be attained by his own doing, but it comes from Christ. Can you imagine? Many of us can imagine, because we too have been there. Maybe you came to Christ when you were young and you didn't quite have a grasp of it all. But over time, like me, you've had many grace awakenings where you said, oh my gosh, this is bigger than I ever imagined. This gift is greater than I could have ever longed for. So in Christ, we have a new pursuit. But look at this. We have a new position in Christ. We have a new pursuit of Christ. We have a new position in him. We talk about this all the time. 87 times in the New Testament, we're found in him. This is one of the most powerful doctrines that you can grasp. This again separates the disciple from anyone else on the planet. No Buddhist ever says, well, I'm in Buddha. No Muslim ever says, I'm in Muhammad. No Hindu ever says, I'm in Vishnu or one of the other millions of gods. Can you imagine a Jew saying, I'm in Moses, I'm, I'm, I'm in Abraham. Uh, and, and only we do this. We are in Christ Jesus. His righteousness covers us so that when God looks at you, he sees you totally forgiven, covered. We often think about the, by the blood of Christ, even beyond his righteousness covering us. It, it'd be like you today. You see me here. I'm in my suit. I'm in my suit. I'm in my clothes and I'm glad you're in clothes as well. We're all in clothes, not as my dad used to, not in the birthday suit, right? We're in our clothes. I see you in your clothes. You could go get in your car on the way home and I say, I see you in your car. That's your car. I know that car. There you are. 
I can say you get in your house or your apartment, your condo, say you're in your house. You're in, you're in there. So you could get in the car this week and you could be driving along 65 miles an hour in your car. You could get on a plane this week. Go fly. I can see you take off. There you are. I see you. You're in that plane. The point is this. You may not look like much apart from your, your suit or your clothes, um, but you, or you might not be able to run 65 miles an hour. You get in a car, you can do, you may not be able to fly, but if you get in the plane, you can soar. As the scripture says, if you're in God, if you're in Christ, you can soar like eagles. You can live a life that is first found in him and you can now live with this resurrected power he's gonna reference here in a moment, in your life right now. You can live a life of joy, of peace. Look at verse nine, the latter part. This is a righteousness that comes from God that depends on faith. Praise be to God, it's faith and not works. Paul has a new position in Christ because he's received a new righteousness by Christ. Look, the happiest day of your life, you know it's true for Paul, the happiest day of your life is when you realize that you don't have to be righteous or become righteous, but that you already are righteous in him. The greatest day of your life. This is the greatest truth that you can ever know. Like him, when you discover your failure, your sin, you realize that righteousness can't be produced, but it can be provided through Christ and through him alone. In Romans 4, you could go there and look at chapter 4. Four times he talks about a righteousness that's imputed. You've heard this maybe. The imputation of righteousness, meaning that it's been accounted to you. On your side of the ledger, Christ's righteousness has been accounted to you. Your sin has been accounted to Christ. His righteousness imputed into you. We talk about the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on your behalf, my behalf, in order that we might become, anybody? The righteousness of God in him. Amen and amen. This is another, another gospel in a single verse. His gracious account. God treated Jesus as you deserved to be treated so that he could treat you as Jesus is deserved to be treated. Somebody said amen. Ha. Praise be to God. What we should have, this is why you can never say, Lord, give me what I deserve. You can never say, give me what I deserve. And yet we live with this entitlement. I did this. Doesn't it count for something? See, everything we do, ministry, loving others, forgiving others, is in response to what is placed in our ledger, on our side. All that we've gained, we then do it all for him and to his glory. E. Stanley Jones was a missionary in the early part of the 1900s. He went to India for much of his life. He's been known as the, the, the Indian Billy Graham. And he's long since passed away. But he came back to the States. He said, the, the evangelized non-believer is the hardest to reach. He said this, we are inoculating the world with a mild form of Christianity so that it is now practically immune against the real thing. Adrian Rogers, the old preacher of old, he said this, the worst form of badness is human goodness substituted for God's righteousness. Whew. Don't wear your righteousness. Don't wear your own righteousness before holy God. Friend, today, if you've never received Christ, you need to see, you have, you need a new pursuit. You've got to be in a new position and finally, what we have in him, we need a new power with Christ. Paul qualifies this further. Look at this, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share, this is that word koinonia, fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death. He's saying it keeps getting better. I have a new power because I now have a new fellowship in him. Listen, in Christ, 
You have this new power because you have a new resurrected life in him. What kind of fellowship is this? And what is this fellowship of suffering? We don't like that part. I've talked to this uh, with, with many of you, with our staff and others about this this week. What is this fellowship of suffering? Paul wants it. Do you want it? If your pursuit is to know Christ, you want it. You want it because look at this. What kind of fellowship is this? It's a personal fellowship. Look at this. Firsthand knowledge that I may, that I may know him. Then he says it's a powerful fellowship. Power of his resurrection. But watch this. It's a painful fellowship. I'm going to share in his suffering. Paul is saying good, bad, the highest moments in life, the lowest, the worst moments I go through in my life. And some of us are going through them perhaps right now. He's saying, I want to know the fellowship of Christ in the worst moments of life. Because then I know for certain and others can see the glory of God through my life, when I realize I am with him, I'm in him, and I'm with him in my suffering. My joy, my purpose, my pursuit is not determined by circumstances around me. Because look at my circumstances. My joy is found in Christ. So through the worst of times and the best of times, I want to know him. And if it means I go through suffering, I want to know Christ. Because that's all my life is about. We all know that suffering is one of life's greatest enhancers to knowing Christ. Every one of us could share a testimony. All of these benefits, assets, gains, even, yes, suffering is gain. So that, look at verse 11, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying, he's not saying I can attain this like I can get it. He's saying I want in on this any way possible. I want in on this. And friends, listen, on the last day, when you stand before God Almighty, will you be there saying, let me, hold on, I brought a resume. I did, I was a good, I really, I made a lot of money and I sought to be uh, really kind to people. I was re- are you gonna try to bring your own righteousness to God? Friend, you cannot rest in your own righteousness. And you, if you've never received Christ today, Today is your day. It's why you're listening to me online. It's why you're in this room right now. That you would exchange your garbage, your best intentions, your best works, filthy rags before holy God. And and I, I love you so much. I want you to know this. There's a righteousness that has come to us in Christ. And it is worth everything. There is no other name but the name of Jesus, Christ alone, you must turn to him for salvation by faith and receive his grace right now. And in so doing, you have a new confidence. I hope you're feeling it today. Believer, disciple, listen, live with a new confidence this week. Be confident in him. You have a new pursuit of Christ. You have a new position in Christ and you have a new power with him now and for all eternity. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you our lives. What else would we do? What else can we do? In response to your righteousness, you gave your life on the cross. You took on what we deserved so that we could take on what you deserve. And it demands our all. We give our lives to, we gamble everything away. We wager everything in this life so that we might gain you. You are Lord. And friend, if you're here and you've not received Christ, maybe you have in this hour, maybe now to say, yes, Lord, I give you my life. I'm sorry that I've tried to be good enough somehow. I confess my sin. I repent of even my best works. And I receive your grace right now. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving your life to me so that I can gain all that you have for me. Lord, we praise you. We love you. We give you our lives. And the church said, amen and amen.